chances that it's still going to be too long. And we are live for the 17th episode of B- Burning Subjects. And today... 17, <laughs> oh, oh, oh. I'm sorry. It's okay. But tonight on yeah, Canned... You're still not old enough to do uh, the deity, but whatever. But tonight so. on Canned Canucks, we're going to talk Welcome about some... Of mistakes. Yes, we're going to be that talking about... should have been aborted. We're going to be talking about canned Canucks. You know, some locomotives that either weren't built properly, but could have been success- successful, or ones that were downright shit from the start. Stephen, but yeah. would, probably, uh, Stephen would probably initiate uh, 3254. Uh, uh, yeah, exactly. Well, 3254 isn't going to be on this list because that locomotive, originally, when it was first built, it was a good locomotive. It was its excursion oh. career that went down the toilet. Yeah, and, and it's you know, the because of the head on collision. But, yeah. Uh, well, the main reason I hate it is because of the trade between Steamtown and the Gettysburg for Nelson's favorite engine. Well, hmm. no, we know that by now. Anyway. Is this actually a special list or something, or just no. are we randomly go? Are we randomly going to talk about locomotives that were actually uh, pieces of shit? Mostly just random. Like the first one I wanted to talk about was easily fixable, and it's of course the thumbnail. I have to look this up on YouTube. Let's see. Is it the Pennsylvania T ones? No. Oh, fuck you. Yeah. The, the, the LBN SCRE 2s. Yeah. Okay. The most overrated class of tank engine. Exactly. And that's well, why we're going to be talking. And they're well deserved. And that's well, why we're talking about them today on well, Cal. We're, like we're like Britain's most overrated class of steam locomotives, period. Well, and anyway, the E2s are. Con- well, controversial with heavy quotes because it seems though that in the railroad fan community, there's one side and there's the other. One side is actually knowing that the truth of these E2s were that they were built from the ground up to replace an actually good engine and were terrible at their actual job. And then there's the other hand that says that they're the greatest locomotives of all time. Yeah. Hold on, uh, I'm just gonna see if I can find uh, some uh, attractive effort uh, stats on steam locomotive uh, dot com. But either way, I do, I do uh, see them on twenty one thousand uh, something. Twenty one thousand something pounds for the heat. Was there? Yeah, I mean, I have seen them on Wikipedia, but I'm just I just want to look on steamlocomotive.com to see if there's any uh, difference. But anyway, why am I doing this? Because I'm I'm at my podcast, Anthony. <laughs> it's okay. But anyway, about these E twos. Well, actually, let me go get my model. Is it a Thomas model? No, it's not a Thomas model. It's a no, double it's, uh, it's painted up in uh, Southern uh, livery. But I do remember that they're not having an old LB and SCR number. What was it, 104? I, I don't know, I think. I'm not, I'm not so sure. Yeah, uh, okay, so needless to say, when it comes to the E2s, they were designed by uh, Mr. Uh, L.B. Billington, uh, Lawson uh, Butskopsky Billington. That's his full name. Rolls because... right off the, rolls, that name rolls right off the fucking tongue. Yeah. Whatever. Anyway. Now that uh, I... Ten of them were built between 1913 and 1916. Numbered 100 through 109. Uh, five. The first five of these were, you know, regular E2s. Like this the one. Other five were sl- uh, hold on. Let me actually uh, check this stream. Like this uh, one. That doesn't have yeah, the extended yeah. side tanks. Yeah. You got, you got number 104 there in inauthentic southern green, but that's besides the point. That's basically like a regular... E2. With yes. The old fashioned standard box shaped water tanks. Yeah, I like these E2s. Number five uh, were classified as E2Xs because they actually had the slight extension over the water tanks. Like, not that the water tanks themselves were completely longer, but there was a noticeable notch in the bottom so you could still kind of access the 
running gear and valve gear within the frame because the driving wheels only have coupling rods on the outside of them, you know, inside cylinders and whatnot. Uh, let's see. But they were still ridiculously thirsty. Yeah, uh, let's see. Tractive effort. Um, Wikipedia says four feet six inches, so that's 54 inches. What does steamlocomotive.com say? That says... Well, ba, 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 ba. as Stephen said inches. about these okay. things being extremely hungry... Uh, 170 PSI and cylinders 17.5 by 26 inches. Is that the same on both of them? No. SteamLogomod.com says 17, just 17 by 24. Wikipedia says 17.5 by 26. But anyway. Oh, no, wait, 17.5 by... As Steven it's said about these... Roughly 20 to 21,000 pounds. Roughly. That's all you need to know. You can do further research on your own. But anyway. I mean, exactly links, links to uh, to both Wikipedia and, uh, let's see, the fucking uh, uh, Steam, steamlocomotive.com page. But anyway. As Steven said earlier about the locomotives being extremely thirsty, the reason for that is because the boilers themselves were recycled from retarded tank engines which were 442 tank engines originally. And those boilers were not successful for being very hungry for fuel. And they weren't suitable for shunting. What, well, they were, but they weren't good for what the locomotive was intended for. And so they threw the boilers away originally. But no, they decided to uh, cut budget and use those stupid recycled boilers on these that were meant to yeah, replace... Um... Their predecessors, yeah, those, the E1. The locomotives in question were the, I want to say the I2 Atlantics or the L2. Uh, uh, you know, I think it was the L2. It, yeah, lowercase L instead of capital letter L, but whatever. Um, also, you got to remember that the E2s, they were, uh, they were intended for force shunting or switching and even short distance freight trains. But, but even they sucked at poor, that. Uh, water consumption, I mean, because of their high water consumption or poor water economy, they weren't very good at, uh, you know, running out on the road, even if it was just on uh, on a branch. Well, even besides worse, the fact that they were... Worse, hmm? Even worse, they tried to use the E2s on uh, push-pull service passenger train. Yeah. Yeah, like push-pull is where you have the locomotive cut in the middle of the train, and then you have a few passenger carriages in front of it and a few passenger carriages behind it. But more than yeah. likely because they don't have more than likely because they don't have turning facility right there. They can't like run around the train and couple to the other end or anything like that. Or especially not. Yeah, that way. Anymore. That way they could also uh, you know try to squeeze more services uh, out and uh, try to make more money. But you know. The E2s, they weren't very good for it because, you know, they were very slow and just, and they weren't even, uh, I mean, they were slow, heavy going on water. They might, oh. have good, they might have had good fuel economy, but the bunkers were sadly too tiny. So it's still but. kind of, uh, so it's still kind of averages as, you know, being crap in that area. But and also the brakes were about as useful as, a, as on an original Ford Mustang, needless to say meaning that they were novelty items, or, but, you know, shit. But there's actually another flaw with the E2s that came with them during passenger service. With, with the tanks being on the sides, and of course, well, there was actually a very weird thing with the tanks. They were completely hollow. And so when the locomotive was actually, of course, in service, if it would go over 40 miles an hour, it would begin to jitter from side to side. And even dangerously so, as seen in a railroad magazine of a person who actually used to fire E2s back in his day. He said that the locomotives at 50 miles an hour would begin to jitter dangerously to the point where he could barely hang on. And, well, that's... Um, to put it extra bluntly, I don't even expect the E2s to go about 10 miles an hour. Yeah. But James Mink can walk faster than those things. <laughs> but another thing during shunting service, which they were meant for shunting. These locomotives had a very large wheelbase compared to like an S100, for example. The S100s had a thinner wheelbase so that they could 
go around t- tighter curves. The E2s had a very large one, which prevented them from going to yeah. too many tight curves without having without having the risk of bending something. So, can I uh, can I uh, chime in here for a bit to uh, you know do a bit of further explanation? Yes. Hey, yeah, that's um, funny. Chime, yeah, chime in. You are a five chime boy after all. <laughs> so, um, like, like when it comes to the wheelbase on um, an E2, it it's about fifteen feet. So, like from the center of the first driving axle to the center of the rear driving axle, because you know there are only three axles and uh, period on that thing. That's fifteen feet. And for an 0600 tank engine, I'm going to say that's actually fairly big. And yeah, they were good at switching operations, but they weren't ideal for it. Like the main, uh, like the main stomping ground where it really proved to be kind of problematic was in the dunk area in Southampton. So even though they actually, even though they actually uh, tackled on there for quite some time, that's only because you know they were really fortunate, and the Southern Railway, and later the Southern Region of British well, uh, British Railways, they could uh, they couldn't really afford any kind of uh, replacement for a long time. Yeah, and then when they when they uh, when they tried an austerity saddle tank on uh, at Southampton, even that proved to be a little bit too long. And keep in mind, an austerity saddle tank has a wheelbase of eleven feet. So in the end, uh, the best uh, 060 tank engines for Southampton were the S100s, and the Southern did actually buy uh, 15 of them. One of them was broken up as a bunch of spares. Press F, sad. But the other 14, they performed. They were arguably, you know, they were the American stars of uh, of this little uh, of this little bit of the United Kingdom. And you know, they had a wheelbase. They had a wheelbase of only 10 feet. The perfect, oh, the, man. the perfect, the, uh, the perfect balance between strength and maneuverability. Yes. Oh, and we all know what we all know which uh, S one hundred is my personal favorite. Let me guess. Shit, I no. forgot the number, but it's painted in the red scheme. That Georgia Power ninety seven. That's my favorite S one hundred. Yes, but anyway, as in one of the that hasn't operated in the United Kingdom. But, eh. Another thing... We don't have a bigots. Well, before we go on with the next locomotive, which is also... Also, can I point out, uh, weren't the, um, weren't the E2s numbered in the 2100 series at some point during their careers on the Southern? In other words, the same numbering yeah. as... The, the T1 Northerners from the Reading. Yes, when, uh, when, you know, during the big four grouping of 1923, during the big four grouping of 1923, I'm sorry, Andrew, uh, you know, the locomotives, uh, the LB and SCR was absorbed into the Southern, obviously, uh, and uh, differentiate them, you know, from other uh, pre-grouping locomotives. The Southern Gate added 20,000 to all the road numbers of um, all the former LB and SCR steam engines on their uh, roster. So, yes. Why specifically? Which were numbered as 100s became 2100s, like the famous T Hogs. Why specifically 2100s, though? In other words, they were number 2100 through 2109. Which means we got 2100, 2101, 2102, 2103, 20. Okay, you get the point. But yeah, the first yeah. three. Why? Andrew, oh, take comfort in the fact that these LB and SCR imposters, even though they were, even though they came before the T Hogs, are no longer around. I know, but. So, yeah. I mean, I don't so know, wait. I don't know what's worse. Yeah. I- What's worse, the E2s or 2100 on oil? Pretty sure it's the E2s. Yeah. Yeah, but, like, okay. 2100 on oil is somewhat fixable, I think. It's fixable. But the E2s, you'd have to completely redesign them. Yeah. New boiler, better standards, you get the point. Which actually is what I wanted to... Real highlight of, so for me, the only real highlight uh, of the E2s is, you know, the very end. 
So, you know, just when you think their careers are terrible, something wonderful happens. What? An end. When between 1961 and 1963, they were all retired, and they're all cut up. <clears throat> Which, you know, isn't really that much of a surprise, and the only reason people like the E2 is because of Thomas, and, well, there are shit tons of replicas done up as Thomas. Even, I think they use a Jinty or something like that on the mid hands Railway. And I'm pretty and sure got, that the Jinty actually performs better they, than the E2. Yeah, and, and they, they, they got, actually and they actually quite cleverly come... Some other uh, tourist line or heritage railway, I don't remember which one, but they actually quite cleverly uh, used a friggin' um, uh, they used friggin' uh, Hansel and Austerity. You know, the Austerity Saddle Tank as uh, as the basis for their Thomas. Oh. Uh, and then they got friggin' um, and then of course we can't, we obviously gotta mention old fucking, if Michael was here he would have mentioned the Strasbourg one. Obviously. Yeah. But yeah, yes. which, is, uh, which is based on some uh, H&K uh, Porter or 6 so. Yeah. Granted, it's it's probably the best looking uh, Thomas locomotive, but you know that I think that that individual engine has has risen to fame for the wrong reasons, sadly. But yeah, anyway, there's shit tons of dummy locomotives that were made as Thomas, and shape wise, they are amazing. But anyway, now that we've talked about the faults. And, you know, their inevitable demise. How about we talk about how they could have been fixed? Like, if they dare to make more. Like I said, better boiler. That was actually new. Well, first off, of course, the new boiler. But then I would actually use those side tanks again, except I would, uh, you know, those sort of gr- the dividers that they add in tenders. That's what I would have added inside the side tanks to prevent the water from sloshing around and making the thing shake. Now, our uh, um, Australian friend Ethan in the Cylinder Cox server, he even suggested, you know, just rip the tanks off and, you know, give them a little tender, turn them into a little tender engine. <laughs> yeah. Oh, and basically speaking of tenders. Pull, basically pull a Crab Orchard in Egyptian number five. And of course, um, there's actually... Or, uh, or a GWR 5193. From what I see or here, or the... Fucking, or a fucking Monticello Railway Museum number one. Don't forget that. From what I see from what I see here, the coal bunker actually has plenty of room to extend into the cab and a little bit more outward, too. So the bunker can easily be extended or, of course, increased inside overall. And then the, the wheelbase itself. Of course, shrink it to at least 12 feet. At least 12. And that will be okay uh, for the locomotive top. At least, anyway. 12. And then, of course, I would raise the pressure from a, two, from a 170 to 200. That will allow it to be a little bit better when it comes to push-pull service. It'll be a little bit faster. It'll be a little bit more powerful. It'll be a better engine overall. If you raised it to 210 pounds, it'd be equal to about the same that uh, fucking 425 has. Because I think that's, I think it's boiler, I think 425's boiler pressure is 210 pounds per square inch. Oh, (laughs) looks like the buffer came off of my model. Uh, Just Awesome. That thing's older than my mother. But anyway... Let's go on to the next canned Canuck, which, uh... Well, you do know that Canuck is actually a word that's used, you know, to kind of insult people who are Canadian, right? Yeah. Oops. I'm asking, uh, yes. Tonight on Canned Canucks, I'm going to fly the E2 in an incredibly unreliable car and then blame Steven as he crashes Uh, the escape pod. You know what? Let's dive into super high pressure. Oh. Yeah, I feel like I want to talk about this locomotive. Oh, I, th- I think I know the locomotive. What talk- locomotive is What is it? I'll give you a hint. It's from the London Midland and Scottish Railway. Is it Bullies and Leader? Last year, it would have uh, it would have celebrated its... 90th anniversary, I believe, in, what is it, October? 
What, what is it? I'm not so sure. Is it? Uh, is it that one? I, I swear it looked like maybe like a is either it, a patriot or a royal Scot. Is it the hush hush? No, because that's Tony R. Hudson. Oh yeah, but um, is it? Does it have to do something with bully? No. no. But we are going to have to talk about that. It ended up on the Southern. Yeah, but we are going to have to talk about that later, unfortunately. Oh, God. Yeah, I, I swear there was a... There was a high-pressure, like, 10-wheeler. It was either, like, an experimental Royal Scott or Patriot. You are definitely in that uh, line, uh, Stephen. It's Is it your... A- oh! The one you sent me a photo of and asked me to calculate the tractive effort for. Okay. Yeah, because... The Fury. Thing. Yeah, Fury. Um, so Fury, London Midland and Scottish number 6399, that was a very experimental and sadly unsuccessful, uh, steam locomotive constructed by the LMS. I just the took this tiny of- corn dog out of my mouth steam. when you heard that, when you said that. Yeah, the locomotive was built in 1929 by the North British Locomotive Company in Glasgow. And uh, basically, the whole, the big hallmark is that um, the locomotive used a German designed Schmidt boiler with three chambers. Like I believe the primary chamber that had a um, regular uh, that had a regular pressure of two hundred and fifty uh, psi, which, from what I've heard, is actually the one that you're supposed to use if you want to calculate the tractive effort. But above there, like if you even have had a picture of the boiler by itself, it actually kind of looked like a big machine gun. And above the big chamber with the 250 psi pressure, there were two other uh, boiler uh, chambers with significantly higher boiler pressures. One of them, 900 psi. What? Jesus! Holy black Jesus! 900! And the other one, I shit you not, on average, um, from what I've heard, 1,600 PSI. What? Why? 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 How? How? I've, How? I've, seen sources, <laughs> I've seen sources that state, you know, 1,400 PSI. Some go a little higher to 1,800 PSI. So I pick an average. So 1,600 PSI. How? The idea wheeler. Is it? Is it a ten wheeler? Yes. It's a ten wheeler. It's a ten wheeler, and it has triple the Almost amount of psi 2, 000, of twenty five. Two thousand psi on a ten wheeler. Yeah. How much? How much was the? How much was the uh, big boys? Three hundred. Three, uh, <laughs> oh my god! Yeah, it's a triple chamber boiler specifically made for this kind of stuff. Like, the idea was that they would rapidly increase the pressure of the steam. Uh, you know, they would increase, they would really increase the pressure of the steam in a bit to, uh, to try and increase the thermal efficiency so they could save on uh, fuel. So the oh, would have as high of a fuel consumption. I need a moment. You, you can continue was, talking, but I need a moment. And this didn't, uh, and actually, this didn't really work out that well. But yeah, so you got that. So, yeah, um, the tractive effort of this locomotive is unknown, sadly. The only thing I can say for sure is that at one point, I have come across a source that has stated that the, lo- that the boiler pressure was, I mean, that the tractive effort was 33,200 pounds, a little bit higher than the 33,150 pounds of the Royal Scots on from which the Fury was essentially spawned from. But but I don't think that, you know, 6399 sold, sold any trains, so they couldn't, pro- they couldn't really uh, calculate the tractive effort, I believe. But, so it never uh, actually got, you know, put into, like, service. No, because during one of the tests, uh, one of the high, one of the tubes in one of the high pressure steam circuits had exploded, and steam shot through the firebox doors, 
which uh, killed uh, which killed someone from the super eater company, and it uh, and it terribly scolded uh, someone uh, someone else. So yeah, so I posted in the UK locomotives. I think the top picture is part of its boiler. Uh, Whoa! I think I'm not a, I'm not hundred percent sure, but. It looks like I, whale I teeth. LMS Fury on Google. Basically, the boiler kind of looked like a machine gun. It uh, looks like... It was all stripped. It looks yeah, like uh, whale teeth. What? It looks like whale teeth. Uh, hold on. Let me actually see if I can find a picture of the Fury's boiler. Uh, Did it actually move? Like, how long was it been like you know in existence uh not for very long and i haven't mentioned all the supposed uh variables for the trek of effort yet which has kind of become my thing so if you want to mention those did it like, ever actually move under its own power it did uh, i'm pretty sure that it did just sadly you know turned out to be fatal for someone how but, how does it like I don't understand how you can make a fucking ten wheeler have like fucking three times as much fucking of boiler pressure or whatever the fuck PSI of a big boy a fucking big boy three it, it, three times no, well, no it's not actually no uh, like taking to no, consider it it's not a big boy and it's triple the amount of pounds per square inch of the big boy and it's like. Not even half the size of a big boy. One of the other cha- no, um, as I said, in one of the chambers, it was, uh, you know, it could be as high as six times the uh, boiler pressure of the big boy. But anyway, attractive effort related geometry. I really want to mention that now. So the driving wheels were 81 inches in diameter, uh, just like on the Royal Scots. Uh, the main boiler pressure, you know, the, the big low pressure chamber, 250 psi. So that's the one you want to use. It had three cylinders. Uh, the internal one was 11.5 by 26 inches, and the, the two outside cylinders were 18 by 26 inches. So yeah, if there's anybody out there who would like to calculate the tractive effort of this engine, be our guest because we real because I'm at least. Very curious. Because th- I'm blown away by the fact that Bryn would even consider going to super high pressure steam. If, like, even you remember how we invented high pressure steam in the first, well, we didn't do it, but the UK did. And they, you know, they considered high pressure steam in the first place to be extremely dangerous, and they brought it up to only 50. But now here they are bringing it from like 200 up to ing. 900 PSI, just like that. Yes. Why? Let me see here. What other one should we talk about next? Suckfest 1. No, wait, how about Suckfest 2? Was that really unsuccessful? Oh. Oh, the Benzy S2. Number 6200, the steam turbine. I still had, I mean, it may have had, may have had a, I mean, it was probably a little bit more successful. No, definitely more successful than the Suckfest one. But it had the same terribly limited route availability. Yeah. They, I think they originally wanted to make it a Northern, but, you know. Okay. I, uh. Whoop. This is my buddy. This is my living column right here. But anyway, although um, uh, I dare say that I dare say that like whatever the basically the experimental Princess Royals turbine was probably one of the few like turbines that actually worked properly. Yeah. But okay, so um, here's the here's the chart that I. This uh, web page actually has a small chart where uh, where the LMS sphere where number sixty three ninety nine is on, and it does give you know a vague 
I think a vague estimate of the attractive effort at only 33,200 pounds. Like I said, it's only a little bit higher than the friggin' uh, Royal Scots from which it was based on. But anyway, uh, let's see. Let me actually uh, look up uh, Pen- 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 C 6200. Uh, let's see. Oh, cock not shopping. Fuck. The S2. I don't know how the fuck you would calculate tractive effort on a fucking uh, steam turbine locomotive. Needless to say, it looks like it had 65,000 pounds of it. But to be honest... Driving, <clears throat> driving wheels were 68 inches in diameter, so at least it was more sure-footed than the big boy. Or at least it, you know, could have been potentially more sure-footed than... No, not more sure-footed than the big boy, but uh, more sure-footed than the S1. But, uh, I'm actually, uh, you know, my brain is turning into mush. But uh, actually, about the S2, I feel like that one is probably one of the very few experimental locomotives that didn't, you know, succeed that actually could have been preserved. Because it actually looks cool. Like, you just gotta, you look at that. Uh, I'm a bit so-so on it, and I think that, you know, it, it's actually kind of dumb how the thing has four smokestacks. Yeah, it's fucking ridiculous. How many? How many did the? Uh, how many did the turbo motive have? I think uh, one, maybe two at the most. Okay. Yeah, double chimneys are very common. The FEF Northerns, at least the twos and threes, had them. That's one reason why I like the FEF ones better. They're a little bit more conventional looking. But as well, you know. What I was really meaning is, I just think it looks cool. Like, it just looks so industrial that, and it doesn't look too cluttered at the front either. But the, it look, I just like it, like how it looks, but mm, not how it works. Mm. What did you know, the mental engine that I knew? You know what? I think it's. I think it's time, comrade. Tonight on Canned Canucks, we're going to talk about the world's the worst. Russians try their hands at Viagra, comrade. Oh, oh, yes. In other words, the 414-4, basically just the, I guess. The official classification uh, is the AA-20-1. Oh, Thank yeah. You. Thank God only one of them was um, – thank God that only one of these things was built. So, oh, yeah. no. Duh. Oh, Come it, would, it would have so, worked maybe if it was a 4-6-A or – wait. What, yeah, 4 6 eight, four. Yeah, it probably would have been – it would have been better if it was articulated. The Q1. So, one. So at one time, a bunch of Russians went to the United States and they uh, looked at the Union Pacific and they were very intrigued at, uh, you know, at their 412-2 locomotives. Which so, was a great cylinder, by the way. Keep that in mind. Yeah. So the Soviets, they actually tried, they actually thought, you know, we, we could make this, uh, this is good, but we can make it better. So they ditched one of the cylinders. Okay, that's actually not a bad idea, I suppose. Make it a bit more uh, uh, user-friendly. And then they uh, committed the rather idiotic decision to increase the number of driving wheels from 12 <laughs> to 14 on a rigid Making frame. It. Seven Making driving it. axles on a rigid Making frame. It. That's not yes. good. Literally yes, idiots. I, I guess this made it the longest locomotive with a rigid frame and only one engine unit in the entire world. Of course, the longest rigid frame locomotive, if I'm not mistaken, is Suck Best One. Uh, At least when it comes when it comes to length. Uh, I'm not sure, but needless to say, this thing was a complete fucking turd. You don't put. 14 driving wheels on the same frame with only one pair of cylinders because, you know, it meant that the locomotive was a fucking curve straightener. In other words, 
he couldn't really go around curves. Either that, or okay. it would the make those curves. And the track would have probably been a death sentence for this thing. <laughs> and even then, they had some of the drive wheels fitted with like where they could like swivel around, and like they didn't have flanges. Uh, I think. Uh, let me actually uh, look this up. Uh, so the three cent, so the three center driving axles were all blind. Uh, the and the first and the seventh one, so the one up front and the one up rear, they were fitted with lateral motion devices, which uh, allowed them to actually slide from side to side a little bit. Um, but they weren't enough to make this thing uh, work properly. In case you're wondering about tractive effort, let's see. We have um, 1,600 millimeter driving wheels, or about 62.99 inches. Uh Hold on, I gotta look this up on steamlocomotive.com again because I'm not 100% confident with uh, with the Wikipedia. Let's see. Yeah, uh, 63 inches, just about. Boiler pressure, 17 bar or about 246.6 inches. Cylinders, there are only two of them at 740 by 810 millimeters or 29.13 by 31.89 inches. So low pressure sounders. Sort of. Was ninety thousand uh, three was ninety thousand and thirty four pounds, according to uh, steamlocomotive.com. Jesus. <laughs> well, we sure as hell know it could. Well, we sure as hell know that if if it was standard gauge, it could operate between Chicago and Crest Line. <laughs> Let's see. I'm actually kind of curious as to what the gauge is. Uh, 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 huh. Hold on. Uh, 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 gauge, gauge, gauge. Actually, look that up on steamlocomotive.com again. Uh, let's see. Gauge. Five feet. It was too uh, wide. Oh it's, oh, it's broad gauge. Okay. Yeah. Oh. And even then, that wasn't enough. Fat and rush, that fat commie sausage. Uh, but yeah, it, as to the as for those the big problems, it was prone to frequent derailments. Its large number of wheels made it uh, made couplers. Uh, no, let's see. Fuck. Let's try this again. It was prone to frequent derailments, and its large and its large number of wheels made the engine too heavy for the track. Due to its long wheelbase, the, the locomotive also spread the track and wrecked the points of the switches as it passed over. It was too big to fit on the turntables, too powerful for the couplers in use at the time, and it wasn't able to be run at full power due to the very for very long due to its undersized boiler. Whoa! It made a, it made a publicity trip to Moscow, you know, Russia's capital city in Moscow, 1935. Moscow, Moscow, throw the grasses at the ball, baby boy. <laughs> And then it was put into storage at uh, at uh, let's see the the Shabrenica test facility, and finally scrapped in 1960 under the radar. No, it was because it wasn't even uh, publicly stated. Finally, so comrades, never put 14 driving wheels on one frame with two cylinders. It, it, it doesn't work. It, it don't work. It, do it, it. it don't work. Make it articulated. Uh, you want to know the worst part? What? Why? I actually uh, have slight memories of uh, on uh, we, that one time on DeviantArt I saw a drawing of somebody uh, having drawn a Russian steam locomotive with 22 driving wheels on a rigid frame. 11 driving axles with only two cylinders. Then again, I saw somebody with like a. Uh, and here's the part. Manually fired. <laughs> what, what was the entire. You know. <laughs> oh, you can see my face on the stream. That's beautiful, Andrew. That's beautiful. That's some top notch meme material. Yeah, I was just going like. Like something like that. I don't remember. 
I'll probably look back on the stream and <laughs> remember how I. Uh, but anyway. Um. Oh no. Oh no. Now we're gonna have to go to the. No. No. The bully specifics. Yeah. And then the other thing too. And then the other thing by bullet. Okay, I hate to say it, but you know, when it comes to, you know, shitty locomotives, I think I'm just kind of dulled out by the League Pacifics, because at least they were <gasps> rebuilt. Oh my god, it's snowing. It's snowing. And you live in New Mexico? Yep. Get the flamethrower. <laughs> oh, it snowed here a few times. Most recent time it snowed, which was like a, yeah, like, snow, probably earlier this month. It just melted like a day or two after. Okay, so, um, so, so, so uh, when it comes to the, they were obviously designed by Oliver Bully, and it has to be pointed out that, you know, we're not necessarily talking about one single we're not talking about one single class because technically you can't do that. As the as mechanically speaking, the bullets came in two variants. Like, yeah, between the two uh, different classes, there were 140 of them built between 1941 and 51. But here's the key thing. Uh, 30 of these were the merchant navies and the other 110 were known at, were collectively known as the light pacifics because you know they were a bit smaller and lighter compared to the merchant navies which were like the battle of britain and the west country yeah the yeah the light pacifics were divided uh, so uh fuck let me put that again of the 140 bully pacifics that were built 30 of them were merchant navies named after merchant navy shipping companies 66 of them were uh, were West Countries, named after West Country locations and villages in the United Kingdom. And, four, and the remaining 44 of them were known as the Battle of Britain class locomotives, or Bobs, as I abbreviate that. You know, Bob's. Battle of Britain. Bob. <laughs> because, they're, because they were all known after several World War II airfields, squadrons, and all kinds of people who played valuable roles in the Allied forces during the Second World War. So, yeah. Uh, let's see, actually, because, you know, because because they're mechanically a bit different, naturally that would also mean different uh, geometry relating to track of effort. Uh, let's see. <laughs> uh, Pringles. Six. That in common? Uh, out there. Um, I don't know who that was. Mm. I mean, as I said, uh, seventy-four inch driving wheels between both of uh, between both variants. Uh, let's see, boiler pressure. As I was going to say, I can find that. Uh, the Merchant Navy's got uh, two hundred and eighty psi when they were first built, at least. And the same actually goes for the bus countries. All of them had three cylinders. Um, the big difference between the two is the cylinder bore. Like both of them at the same pist- both of them at the same piston stroke of twenty four inches. It's just you know the the merchant navies had a bigger bore of eighteen inches. Uh, yeah, the bore on the merchant navies was eighteen was eighteen inches compared to 16.375 inches or three eighths of an inch uh, on the light Pacifics. The light Pacifics therefore generated 31,000 pounds of tractive effort and the merchant navies initially uh, developed 37,515 pounds of tractive effort. I got this from Wikipedia, but at this point I'm actually too lazy to actually look up uh, Look to look it up on steamlocomotive.com and fear of, uh, you know, accidentally finding a page for uh, Southern 
Pacific type locomotives in the United States. Yeah. Southern Pacific Pacifics, which obviously are much more interesting. Which is which is why I said Southern Pacific types. You know, Southern oh, Railroad. Overland types. That's what yeah, I thought no. you were talking about Southern Pacific Pacifics because we No, were I meant Pacific. Pacific type locomotives from the Southern Railway in the United States. Oh, I was afraid okay. I would actually find that first as opposed to the Pacific type locomotives from the Southern Railway in the United Kingdom. Honestly, I'm not really interested in the Pacific types from the Southern Railway in America. But needless to say, um, the Bullies in general, they were a bit of a controversial batch because they were intended to be semi-experimental uh, express passenger locomotives with brand new high-tech, innovative uh, technology. But they but they already had a bit of a check in history right when they were built. Like I said, 1941 through 1951. So, um, because of that, their designer, Oliver Bullied, he could only get the necessary sanctions for building them if he had redesignated them as mixed traffic or dual service locomotives. Granted, they were actually fairly good on freight trains, but they've always been better at passenger uh, duties. So, yeah, there's well, that. Well, they are Pacifics. There's that to take into consideration. Um, but yeah, some of the some of their problems definitely related to their, uh, you know, their friggin' um, high tech, their, their friggin' technology. Um, uh, for starters, there was that big air smooth casing that they had. It wasn't really proper streamlining. And it was intended that it would be clean in rotary carriage uh, washing plants and the like. But that didn't actually happen that often. So, yeah. Hmm. There's uh, that. Hmm. Hold on, let me actually get... What was that? Uh, I was I was actually you know doing the big doing a quick search on uh, Microsoft Word. I wanted to see if I can do a if I can quickly recover the script for my old top ten least favorite locomotives. So I can you I know. Think something caught, I think we have to we have to mention chain driven valve gear, of course. And that's going to be you know that, that's the that's going to be the big problem at the end. Uh. But yeah. Furthermore, uh, you know, uh, it was, I mean, the, the casing was designed to be removed as a single unit, but that still wasn't a conventional form of maintenance. You didn't have any dampers on the, you didn't have any dampers on the ash pen or the firebox, so the fire could be really difficult to control. They used quite a lot of uh, welding technology, but that was in there. But back then, in the early 1940s, welding was still in its infancy. So as a result, the uh, welded boilers and the box box driving wheels that they used kept cracking. In fact, it was so bad that the prototype West Country locomotive, uh, which debuted in 1945, by the way, that needed a brand new boiler after only its first run. What? And, you know, the good materials for we for welding were really difficult to come by. So, yeah. Um, let's see. You also had the steel firebox, which was supercharged with thermic siphons. Now, this was ultimately actually a good thing, but it did also have a draw. It did also, it was also something of a bad thing because it led to the temperature in the cab being, you know, a bit warmer than it would usually be. Because thanks to those uh, siphons, the boiler proved to be very uh, free steaming, and you know the cab turned out uh, was along the lines of, of an incubator. Yeah, it was really damn warm there, so you definitely got to have a lot of water uh, to drink there. Um, let's see what other problems did they have? Um, there were reports about their steam-driven reversing gear, which didn't have any kind of refined control. Like, that's what the report said, so that was uh, a bit of a problem. 
Uh, and uh, despite being, despite having a pretty good uh, ride comfort, they were notorious for wheel slippage. Uh, though I don't think quite as bad as other classes that we can mention, but yeah, the slipping was a bit of an issue. But of course, the big problem was the fact that uh, was the fact that these engines were uh, initially built with Bullitt's very own chain-driven valve gear, which had its own list of problems. It was contained in a big oil bath, uh, 40 imperial gallons, which I believe is about 48 uh, U.S. gallons underneath the locomotive. And, you know, that valve got its own big list of problems. Um, the oh, chains, that, that just seems the chains, odd. The chains tended to stretch, you know, so they could jump teeth in the cogs and gears like on a poorly maintained bicycle. They cause all sorts of damage. It was, you know, it was goddamn fucking difficult to access. Maybe if you actually managed to access it, your clothes would be ruined from soaking up residual oil. And um, the oil consumption was actually pretty damn alarming. Statistically, about four imperial miles, I mean, four imperial gallons for uh, 400 miles, which wouldn't even be a friggin' uh, a friggin' trip from Waterloo to Bournemouth, I believe. And in the worst case scenario, you could have leaking oil getting sucked up in between the asbestos lagging that was uh, between the boiler and the casing, which in turn could cause some of those locomotives to um, spontaneously combust, or if you want to put it slightly differently, go out in a blaze of glory. So, yeah. Funny, they are Pacifics, and in 1985, a Pacific exploded. Ha. Huh? Oh, it, was, it, wasn't, it, it wasn't in the sense of, you know, exploding like a catastrophic boiler explosion. It was more so that they would catch fire. But even then, that wasn't actually quite as dramatic. Nor did it happen uh, as often. Nor did it happen very often, thankfully. But even so... Uh, Long before that, British Rail would have more than enough of Bully's supposed innovations. So, at the end of the day, they decided to friggin' uh, execute a big and comprehensive rebuilding program to essentially turn them into an unofficial 13th uh, member of the British Rail standard uh, range. So, you know, they did a metric shit ton of simplifications. I mean, uh, huh. here's actually a good example. Uh, well, here's a before and after. In, in uh, let's see, UK locomotives, here's a picture of uh, 35027 Port Line, which is one of the merchant navies to be preserved. Um, actually scroll down here and uh, get to click on its uh, page. Oh, no other pictures. Let me actually uh, look up a different one then. See. For, and then in comparison, here we have uh, oh, that picture is way too big. Let me find something. Okay. This will do. This will do. In comparison, here's a lovely color picture of uh, 35028 climb line <laughs> illustrating how the bullets looked after they were rebuilt. So you can tell immediately that, you know, some drastic, uh, some drastic conversions have taken place. Hmm. Yeah. Three sets of Walsh shorts, uh, valve gear. So, you know, much more, uh, conventional, uh, granted they still have that slightly odd looking oval shaped, door, but I guess that's kind of part of the ancient identity. Um, they ditched the steam-driven reversing gear, the chain-driven valve gear, and the airsmith casing that was all thrown away with. Uh, they raised the walkways or running plates above the driving wheels so you wouldn't have to deal with any kind of uh, wheel arches or splashes over the driving wheels. 
And they also added an eccentric rod. Yeah, because, you know, three sets of uh, ball shirts, motion, like I said. Um, and there were, uh, and there were uh, still some innovations that were kept, like the steam generator, which was actually uh, quite cleverly hidden underneath the cab floor. So, yeah, these things were actually fitted out with electric lighting. Um, you also had uh, the fire, you also had fire, uh, firebox doors that were, you know, kind of like the US or Canada style butterfly doors. You know, they could swing open and shut, and they could do so either manually with a lever or, you know, uh, automatically with, uh, with a bit of steam. Uh, welding technology. Where the wheels was uh, better to come by now, so I think they still have the same boiler and definitely the same wheels. The firebox was also kept because even though it still got a bit warm in the cabs, it was very free steaming. So in the end, it did prove out it did prove itself to be more of a good thing rather than a bad thing. So yeah. <laughs> Although I'm pretty sure there are engines that are still preserved and operating in spamkins, but I don't know if they. Did they actually, like, you know, iron out the flaws that they had? Um, I don't think so. Like, in order to iron out the flaws of the spam can, really, you just have to do a complete rebuild of the thing. So, yeah. But, as Chris even Green said it in his uh, Steam, Loco and Prof, uh, Steam Locos and Profile episode that he did of these uh, things, way back in the early 2010s, and as such, that episode is uh, part of his uh, Volume 1 DVD. If you give one of the unrebuilt bullets, still in spam can condition, to the correct people who know what they're doing, they can still put on a good spectacle. So, if they're treated right, you know. Yeah. But, it appears, though, that, uh, well, <clears throat> today we were supposed to be on a bit of a schedule, but... I really was in a hurry because yesterday we weren't able to do it, but that's okay. But we're going to have to make this a part two. We're going to have to make another uh, part. Hold on. Uh, 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 one last note. Um, yes. The Merchant Navies, I believe, actually got a little bit of um, of a reduction, actually, uh, when it comes to um, – when it comes to being uh, – Rebuilt reduction. Yeah, like they, like when they were rebuilt, the merchant navies actually got a lower boiler pressure of um, two hundred and fifty psi, which in turn lowered the tractive effort to thirty-three thousand four hundred and ninety-five pounds. Tonight on anal reduction. And in case you're wondering how long these locomotives lasted, um, they actually. Uh, like quite a few of them still ended up, uh, like uh, quite a few of them made it to the end of Southern Region Steam on British Rail in July of 1967. And of the friggin' and of all the 140 bullets that were built, uh, 31, or you could say 30 and a half, were preserved. Uh, 11 merchant navies, though one of them is opened up so you can see the insides. Which I which I'm a little bit meh on, um, and then twenty light Pacifics. Ten of those are span can. But one thing that is actually pretty noticeable for the merchant navies is that one of the survivors, number three five zero eleven, general steam navigation, is undergoing refurbishing. But it's actually going to be rebuilt back to the span can condition because. Because of all the, because um, when that rebuilt program was uh, commenced in 1959, I believe, it lasted until 1961, and uh, all 30 of the merchant navies were rebuilt, and I want to say 60 of the of the light Pacifics. It also has to be kind of noted that you know the the bullies weren't all built by the Southern. Some of them were built after nationalization. Should I mention that too while we're at it? Well, we'll, me- we'll have to mention it in, t- in the next part because, well. All right. Because the sequence is fucking. 
But and, we'll and, another week. and also, uh, we have a lot of locomotives to talk about in this one because Canned Canucks. But anyway, we will see you yeah. guys next time on Canned Canucks. All right, bye. See you next you time. Love, Joe. Next you time on Canned Canucks, we're going to be talking about Suckfest 1. And while doing that, we're going to shove su- uh, su- 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 Suckfest 1 of Donald Trump and also give it to the president as a result. Not sure what I'm doing.